Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise, Father. We thank you. What can we render to you, Father? You did so much for us. You have done so much to us, Father. There is nothing that we can render to you except to praise you, except to praise you, Father, except to worship you, worship the Lord, worship him right now. Give him the clap offering. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We thank you, Father. That is our offer to you. That is our offer to you, Father, at this time. We have nothing more but to say thank you. To say thank you. To lift your name wherever we go. To magnify your name. To glorify your name. Let the Lord be lifted up. We lift you, Father. Thank you. We give you all the glory and all the praise. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. You may have a seat in the presence of the have a seat in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be in this place. And I know all of you are happy to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, my name is Sokema. And I'm a son in the house and a messenger in the house too. Amen. So, at Cross Point, we love people. We love God first, and we love people. So, when you are in our presence here, we know we love you. Amen. Amen. And uh, I have come to give you a word. God speaks to his people. God speaks to his people mainly in two different ways. He can bring his word by utterances. In the midst of the service, God can speak to one person to come up, speak through one person who will come and speak his word directly, and that will be the way it is God wants it to be at that moment. But God can also speak to his people through vision, through a prophet that sees a vision or in a dream. So what that word comes to you, it's in a, a form of a reported speech. So I am going to report to you because God is not speaking right now. He spoke to me and I'm reporting it to you. Amen. So the report goes this way. You know, when God speaks, sometimes he rebukes us. Sometimes he tells us what is going on well. Sometimes he gives us a caution of an impending trouble that is coming. So he cautions us to avoid it. And this, this time, God is saying to us, you have been looking at the situations of the world through the lens of the world. We look at things happening in the world now using the eyes of the world. How the world looks at it, and we are the children of God, and we are starting to look at things the way the world looks at it. But God is saying, no. I am for you. Once you accepted me, I have taken control of your situation. And God spoke to me and he used a verse. He used a section in the Bible, in the book of Joshua. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. But he started relating to me before. He said, you know, my children, the children of Israel, I took them out of the land of Egypt. They were in bondage. And I took them out of the house of bondage 
And I took them, I parted the Red Sea for them. And they walked on dry ground. But when they came out on dry ground, they forgot one thing that I did for them. In their hopeless situation, I brought them out. But in the desert, they started complaining. Complaining against me, God. Talking, complaining against Moses, my servant. Until I brought them out to the Jordan. But now I told my servant, Joshua, I said, build memorial stones, the 12 stones of remembrance. These were to be stones that when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan, they would remember. They would not forget. Earlier when they crossed the Red Sea, they, built, they, they erected 12 stones, but those stones represented the 12 tribes, but it didn't mean much to them. But now the 12 stones that God instructed Joshua to build after crossing the Jordan was to be a memorial for generations, a memorial forever. That was not only to remember that God helped them, did some wonders for them to grow across the Jordan, but it was to be an inspiration for them. Inspiration in the sense that whenever they faced their Goliaths in the new land, they would look back at the 12 stone and they would know God did it for us. He will do it here. Whenever they faced the strong tribes, whenever they saw Jericho, they knew that, you know, God did it for us. And he is going to do it for us again. So they found strength in the memorial stone. And God is speaking to us now that my children build for me memorial stones. Build for me memorial stones of gratitude, of thanksgiving, of inspiration. The stones that you build for God now is reflecting what you went through. All of us went through something. And build the stones of memorial. And each time you face your issues like your finances, your health, your children, things are going wrong. You don't face it in the way of the world. You look back at the stone, the memorial stone, and you know that God is for me. He did it before. He is going to do it. David was able to defeat Goliath by looking at his memorial stone. When he was looking after the animals, he could tear the bear, he could destroy the lion because God did it. So when he faced Goliath, he faced Goliath with strength, knowing that God did it and he's going to do it for him. For you, build that stone. God is saying, build that stone now. And that is a stone of memory, a stone of strength for you to face any situation. Don't look at situations of this world through the lens of the world. Amen. This is the word of God for you. I know it is also time that we have our offering tied, but I would just like to pray for it. I know people uh, offer through this time, people make their offerings and their tithes online. And for people who are watching us online, you can offer your tithes and offering uh, using your credit cards or your e-transfer. And even for us who are here, you can do the same 
or you can do it at the back. Amen? So let's pray for it. Thank you, Father. I give you praise for your word of strength. Thank you, Father, for encouraging us. Thank you for strengthening us. Father, I pray even for the offerings and the tithes that your children are bringing into the house. Father, bless it. Bless the hands that are giving it, Father. And even those who are not able to give for this time, Father, I pray that you bless them so that they are able to give the next time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can we all stand up on our feet and give a clap of offering to the Lord for the word? I don't need you to do that properly, right? I want to give thanks to the Lord for the word that is. Thank you, Father. Remember the memorial story. Blessed to be in the house of the Lord. Are we blessed to be in the house of the Lord, church? It's minus 31 outside, but we are blessed to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Prophet Okima, for this word. We want to keep our eyes on God. The same God who delivered you yesterday, the same God will keep delivering us. Amen. There's a memorial that he's looking for his people to build. So no matter how top things are, we can look back and see what he have achieved and take us through whatever we're facing. I have some echoes coming that is really bugging me, so uh, son, work on that a little bit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So this uh, month for us is we're engaging Thanksgiving. Somebody say, Thanksgiving, of all the hells happening, that is looking through the eyes of the world that we just heard. Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne. Amen? All right. Praise the Lord. Are you ready for the word? Are you ready for the word? Is anybody excited about Jesus Christ this morning? Come on now. I am glad that the king found me. I'm glad that Jesus Christ found you. It doesn't matter how skillful you are looking for him. If he does not find you, you can find him on your own. Because everything begins with God. And then the love that you have for him, it began with him. It's out of the abundance of the love of God in our heart that we love God and we love people. Glory to God. I would like to bring to you a message that will make you love Jesus a little bit more and being stirred up and you wake up consciously to behold the life that is in you, that is Christ's life. And therefore, go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. The Bible says, But I am afraid that... As the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of your devotion to Christ. Paul is speaking to a church he planted. And he said, you guys are rich in gifts. You guys are rich in understanding of the things of the Spirit. But I am concerned for one thing. I'm afraid that you don't get deceived. The word deceived there is the Greek as a pata that speaks of being seduced. I don't want you to be seduced. I don't want you to be misled. 
Like Eve has been seduced or misled by the serpent. Taking you away from the simplicity of the gospel. I said, I'm going to say it again, ladies and gentlemen. The pulpit, when we come to the house of the Lord, it is for you and I to hear the gospel so we can grow in knowing Christ. It's not to give you skills to be a millionaire. It's not to give you principles for personal development. That is not our assignment as a church. And that should not be the assignment of any church or any pastor or any prophet or any teacher. If you have been anointed in the fivefold ministry, you have been anointed to preach one message and it's the message pertaining to Christ. Jesus Christ did not come so you can have an amazing marriage. Jesus Christ didn't come so you can be loaded with financial breakthroughs. Jesus Christ came that you may have life, eternal life. Life and life are abundance. The university cannot give you that life. The seminars cannot give you that life. The wise of this world are void of such. Only one, Jesus Christ. If I begin to teach you anything else than Jesus Christ, then I'm competing with the university. I am not a lecturer. I'm a teacher of the word. I'm a preacher of the word of God that testify of Jesus Christ that you may have life eternal. That's it, period. If you want to learn about business, there is other seminars and other schools that will give you the wisdom acquired to gather wealth. But here, every Sunday, when you come to the house of the Lord, we don't want to teach philosophy. We want to give you the word of life, hallelujah. Zoe, the redemption that we have in Christ, the hope of glory that we have in Christ, the life eternal that we have in Christ. That's why we are here. Hear me. Every preacher at one time or another need to learn and grow and receive instruction from the Lord and redefine his message. I'm not here condemning the preacher outside. I have done it myself. Where we don't teach people so that they, they have what it takes to make it in life. You don't come here to make it in life. My God over here. I am preaching right now. You don't come here to what you can make in life. That's the message that we are hearing today. There are more depressed Christians than the worldly people. Their suicide rate is increasing. Christians are depressed, discouraged. That's the word the prophet just said. Because they see everything through the lens of the world. Let me tell you one of the reasons why. It is because when they come to church, they tell them how special they are. We have turned the gospel to build up people. Instead of the gospel to give life. So when you come to the church and you hear a message about focus on yourself, you know you are not a small person. You know what? You can make it. Ah, you can achieve it. In fact, people think the more Christian you are, you should be rich. You know, how can you be serving God you don't have one car? How can you be serving God you don't have your real estate company? How can you be serving God and you're struggling financially? How can you still be serving God and you are poor? No, when you serve God, ah, wealth needs to be there. When you serve God, prosperity needs to come. How come you, you don't have a problem? That's not the gospel. The gospel is not motivation. When you listen to such message, then you come to Jesus Christ just so you can gather to yourself or materialistic wealth. That is greed. It is greed. We are preaching greed messages. Many Christians, those watching me and those here, and many others in the world, you need to check your heart to know why you come to church. Why do you follow Jesus Christ? Truly. I am preaching right now. Why are you here? So that you can buy a house and a second one, and another car, so you can prosper. No, no, no. Hear me, brothers and sisters. Let's be realistic. When you listen to such message, 
The day you pursue all this stuff in Jesus Christ's name, and you are not able to gather the wealth to you, and you are not able to have that breakthrough, you are supposed to have breakthrough if you are really in Christ. You are supposed to be prosperous if you are really in Christ. Christ died for you, you can be prosperous. And how come you are not prosperous? Something might be wrong with you. You might not be doing enough prayer or enough fasting. You know, we need to see the fruit. The fruit has to be the prosperity of God being released upon you. Now, when you hear such a teaching, the day you are not able to buy your house, you depress. When you are not able to achieve financial breakthroughs, you depress. That's not the gospel. That's why many Christians abandon. That's why they drop out. That's why they get discouraged because they don't have a, a house yet. They were not able to pay off all their debts. How come I'm in Christ? Because of that type of message they are hearing. It's craftiness. You've been deceived. Hallelujah. I'm working hard here. Hallelujah. I have come to tell you there is light in the cross pole of Jesus Christ. No more deception. No more pursuing things that should not be pursued. Matthew 6, 33. Seek for the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will follow you. How come you are chasing after it instead of it following you? That's why people depress. That's why people become discouraged. That's why people become oppressed. That's why they give up. That's why they can't wake up from their bed because they're not seeing the result of this gospel. The, the gospel they hear, they don't see the result. But that's not the true gospel. Hear me, brothers and sisters. We need to get back to the joy of our salvation. I say we need to restore. God restore unto us the joy, the joy of what? Of our salvation. This is King David in Psalm 51 verse 12 who say that. David was the king. He has everything he ever dreamed about. David did not have poverty. All the treasure of Israel has his name on it. Every land belonged to him. Now, this is the cry of a man who has nothing to miss, nothing lacking. The very thing you and I will pursue and chase after, David never pursued or chased after because David had everything already, but yet at the end of the day, after he counted all his houses, after he counted all his servants, after he counted all the land, after he gathered all the treasure and looked at it, he said, how come I still lose sleep? I have everything, I'm still losing sleep. And he concluded, uh-oh, it's because I have lost the joy of my salvation. It doesn't matter how much money you have in your account. Return to the joy of your salvation. Because that's why Jesus Christ came. Is somebody agreeing with me this morning? Say, yes, I agree. Oh, David said, give back to me. I will trade my houses, my land, my treasure, my fame, as long as give me back the joy of my salvation. Give me back the joy of my salvation. We use God to produce and chase materialistic things. And we add Jesus at the end. Are you ready? Hear me. Jesus Christ said, if I cast out demon by the finger of God, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is not having preeminence in the political realm. We deform the gospel. The kingdom of God is not to be having preeminence on the marketplace. That's what we've been teaching here. And preaching nowadays, you know, Christian, you need to go in the marketplace and represent Christ as the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the political arena, so that we can change the laws. The kingdom, that's no kingdom of God. Jesus is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not in the secular world. The kingdom of God is in you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The kingdom of God is not a takeover. That's what they thought. They say, Jesus, you come, you're going to liberate us finally from the oppression of the Romans. Yeah, your kingdom has come now. Where is the army? We have Peter, we have John, we have James there, we have Bartholomew, we have Philip now. We are 12 people here. We need to recruit more people so we can overtake. Do you have a strategy, Jesus? Do you have the attack plan? Because we gotta, we got to have a push now. 
We're going to take over the government of the Roman. Jesus said, no, no, no. My kingdom has nothing to do with that. It's not of this world. My kingdom is me. So, is greed. Go in the marketplace, produce money. I preach it too. Go in the marketplace. That's why we need to be produced. No, that's not the kingdom. That's not the kingdom. The kingdom is a man. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the Christ in you. His kingdom is in you. His glory is in you. Hallelujah, somebody. Go make money is good for you, but no kingdom. Jesus did not come for a takeover. He's taking over already. You know what his kingdom is? Is him. If he's in you, the kingdom is in you. We need to preach this gospel so many people can come in this kingdom and receive children, Christ in them. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's not to go and build businesses and take over the economical realm because that's where the Antichrist is going to take over and go in the political realm so we can change the law. Who told you that? That's why we've been preaching. It's not the gospel. The gospel is not motivation. The gospel is not a takeover. The gospel is a person and it's the person of Jesus Christ. If he lives in you, the kingdom has the right. Fini. Hallelujah. Uh, I haven't even read this verse fully. I am afraid that as the serpent deceived is by his craftiness, your mind will be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of the devotion of Christ. For if one comes and preaches another gospel, another Jesus, see you can have another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit, you can have a different spirit, which we have not received, or a different gospel, another gospel, which we have not preached, you bear this beautifully. In other words, you happily put up with such. How can you put up with such? When they tell you this seat, right there, this seat, there's an angel on it. Hallelujah, I see an angel on it. The first single woman who will sit on it and deliver 1,000 here. Your husband is coming right now. That's a different Jesus. That's a different spirit. And that's a different gospel. Since when we are worshiping servant, an angel is the servant. We will judge angels. So what the heck it is that all your vision is just angels hanging around. That's a different spirit. But if you chase miracles, you will be deceived. Miracle is not a sign that God is. I spoke to you already. Eden, the wish doctors in Egypt perform miracles. A miracle is for you the sign that God is there, you are deceived already. But yet this generation, they don't want to sit down and teach and be taught to grow and learn about Christ. They want the goods. They want the miracles. They want the wonders. They want the money. They want the fame. They don't want to sit down and learn about Christ. Because it doesn't sound powerful. We preach a gospel that is centered on humanity. Humanism. Obama said, yes, you can. I said, no, you cannot. You can only do it because of Christ in you. I can do all things through Christ who will strengthen you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Am I preaching good? Galatians 1.6. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I love Jesus. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by his grace of Christ. He said, I'm amazed. That word amazed, I'm shocked. I am shocked. How quickly you are turning away so soon from the one who called you by the grace of Christ. For a different gospel. Verse 7. Which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you. And want to distort the gospel of Christ. Are you hearing me? Paul said, I am really shocked. How quick you are turning away. From God who called you. 
through grace in Jesus Christ. He said there are some of you, some people are disturbing you. The church of God is being disturbed really, really. I met a lady a few months back at the closing of the year. She said, I need prayer. I said, ah, Mama, what can we do? I just lost my four houses. I lost, I lost, and the few money I have, I went and see Major Five in South Africa and another Major Two in somewhere else there and gave them all my money and then Major So and Major So. Listen to me, please, please, please. Don't you know your plate number on your car? Are you that retarded that you don't remember your address where you live? How can you be flabbergasted by such? Chasing after signs and wonders and miracles and prophetic word that changed none Focus on you, not on Christ. We just heard the real word. Are we so desperate that we'll give all our money to some so-called prophet? Oh, I see. I see this. Yeah, your plate number is this. I don't care. I know my address. I know the car I drive. I know my plate number. There is only one major, and his name is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the only name given to man by which man can be saved. People are disturbing you. Meaning what? It's a deformation. They are troubling you. Galatians 3.1. You foolish Galatians. I didn't say that. I, I'm just reading the Bible. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. You foolish Galatians. The word foolish there is void of understanding. Retarded. Who has bewitched you? You know the word bewitched? Who has captivated you? And make you a captive. Who have seduced you? Before whose eyes? You, you've seen Christ save you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go to Acts chapter 16 as I'm preparing to land. Acts 16. The world, we have to see it through the eyes of God as we just heard. Hear me. It's my responsibility as your shepherd to warn you and to give you instruction so you don't fall in the trap of the enemy. That's what I'm doing this morning. Let's read verse 16 of Acts 16. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination, the kingdom said a python spirit, met us, who was bringing her master's much profit by fortune telling or soothsaying. Following after Paul on us, she kept crying out saying, these men are born servant of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Is she accurate? Is she accurate? Oh, Apostle, you don't know. This prophet, I gave him 2,000. He told me things that it was so accurate. It was, oh, he was right on. Ah, he was so right on. Was she accurate? Yes or no? Okay. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed. How come you're not annoyed? And turned and said to his, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. It's not because somebody gave you an accurate prophetic word that it is God. 
You have to see the spirit behind. Even the witch doctor in your village is accurate. <laughs> if it was today, listen, the, the apostles of today, they will recruit this woman to join the apostolic prophetic team. <laughs> no, no, you didn't hear what I said. Oh, you are accurate like that? You have a call on your life. We need to grow you up. You need to join the, the, the table of the prophets. We need you. No, no, there's something on you. Ah, wow. I, I never seen somebody that accurate like this. We need to recruit you in the team of the apostolic team. Paul said, no. Mm -mm. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. So don't let accuracy mesmerize you. She was accurate in soothsaying. The word soothsaying is the tickling of the ear. In other words, it's telling you what you want to hear. You are so beautiful. People don't know how beautiful you are. Oh, I see your future. So, oh my God, you have such an anointing upon your life. You, you will be the biggest, bonke is zero. You, I see seven times bonke, you will be so phenomenal. People like to be built up. People like to be lied to. Soothsaying, tickling of the ears, build up the ego, and swallow the mind and the head. Walking around like that, nobody can talk to them anymore. Pastor said, we need cleaners. Oh, me not clean, no. Me no clean. I heard a prophetic word. I, I'm supposed to be an evangelist changing the whole world. I'm going to India. Right? You know what this woman was doing? The Bible said, making fortune for her masters. Is that not what you watch on TV when you watch the majors? Majors one or two or three or four or five, and all these prophets there who gather your money, they are after your heart and your money, after your heart and your pocket. That's what this woman was doing. She goes, you, you are the man of God who have been sent to preach the message for the salvation of the world. Wow, we are amazed. She's making money. She win your heart and your pocket. No, did I not read that? She was making money, fortune. That was a business that Paul just bankrupt by the power of the Holy Spirit. He just took them out of business by casting out the soothsaying spirit. Come out! And the master was so angry, they said, now kill Paul now, kill him. He just bankrupt my business. Most people today will hire her, prophesy some more to me. I need to hear more. Uh, what does God is saying? What does God say? Leave it alone. Christ is in you. Christ is in you. My sheep knows my voice. And they follow me. Are you a sheep or not? Stop chasing after prophets and giving all your money. Desperate. Sit down. Listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ so you can learn the things of eternity. Instead of running around giving your money. You don't even type in your own church. But yet you give $2,000 to this prophet who doesn't even know your name. Just because, it, oh, I see your name is Mary. Listen to me. My information are on Facebook. You can go there and capture my phone number and even my address and have a few pictures of my children and my wife. No prophet. I'm preaching right now. I say I'm preaching. My information is on Facebook and Twitter or Instagram. Today you don't need to be a prophet to know the plate number of somebody. Just go on the internet. Google will help you having a prophetic insight. Am I preaching? They have oil for single women. $200 oil bottle if you want to get married. That, that one is for marriage, hallelujah. The other one is 300 for the oil of the favor of Esther, if you want to have favor. This other oil here is for the nightmares you're going through, hallelujah. And this other oil, they are selling oil bottles. You are buying all the oil bottles. All your house is full of oil. But my Bible said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel. I don't need any oil. How many oil are you going to buy to become great? How many water bottles that are holy from a special stream in Israel? No, no, please, somebody talk to me. Oh, we have the Israel prayer show. 
this one is from the olive tree where Jesus was in Gethsemane, that we cut this one out. And this olive is not anything. This one is coming from Israel, pure, pure olive oil from Israel. By the tomb of Jesus Christ, that olive tree is there. Power resurrection is there. Nonsense. Since when the elements will become a carrier of the glory of God, when he has put his glory in the earthly vessel, me and you and you and you, I don't need any olive oil from Israel. And you people, Christian, listen to me. You have a romantic approach to Israel, and you think the Jewish people are saved by default. If they don't hear this gospel that I'm preaching, and bow their knee, and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, they are going to hell the same thing like any pagan. Oh, I want to go to Israel. I'm going to Israel. I'm going to Israel. You know, me too, I want to go to Israel. No, I'm very serious. But Jesus told the Samaritan woman, you, you brag that the place of worship is in the, by the well of Jacob. And you, you brag that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. But the time has come where the true worshipers will worship me not in Jerusalem or on the mountain hill of Abraham or Jacob. But anywhere where they are, they will worship me in spirit and in truth. It's no longer about location. Why? Because Christ is in you. I don't need to go to Jerusalem to see him there. I don't need to go meet him in some sacred areas. Myself, I carry Christ. The day you want to know the address of God, if you see me, that's where God is. Too much oil selling. We are tired of it. They label all this nonsense stuff as a spiritual impartation power and some special cloth that come from Israel. When you, you pray this prayer, prayer show, open your shoulders, oh, the glory of God is increases. Since when an element, listen, we are no longer in the Old Testament. The shadow of the things are being done with. The real deal has been manifested. Why are you still chasing after some stick and some oil? That's the way you get ripped off. Hallelujah. The same anointing is in me. I think I'll stop there for today. I want you to understand this. Don't fall in those hands of sellers of dreams. Sellers of fake, fake dreams. Fake hope. Because of the desperation of humanity. They will rip you up. Empty your pocket like you've never seen before. And at the end of the day, you're more miserable than the first time you met them. A lady called me a few days back. You know, I want to talk to a man of God. This man of God is the only one. I need to talk to him. I've been trying to call him, and I'm not reaching out to him. You know, this man of God, it has to be in Nigeria, right? Because that's where all the powerful men of God are. You know what I'm saying? And then, you know, I can't access to him. But I just know only him when he prayed for me. I'll be okay. I really work. I watch all his videos. I watch all his songs. I watch all his things. I just know finally he visit me in the dreams and the vision. If I don't talk to him, I need to talk to the man. Oh, I feel like something will happen. I need to. But I said, did you have access to him? No, no, no. You know, he's a big man, you know. Uh, maybe you know him. I say, I'm not that big. So at the end of the I still want to talk to him. I say, okay. It's called idolatry. When you begin to put a man of God outside of this. You know what? We are sick and tired of listening to preaching that are out. They are extra curriculums. They bow our head as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray to lift you up in the heart of man because you are life. You came on this earth and you become humanity because you love humanity. You took our sins upon you. You substituted taking our place on the cross 
like a thief, though you were innocent. You became sins so I can become the righteousness of God. You were buried and on the third day you rose again in glory to give life eternal to those who call upon your name. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you've been in, what you've been through, what you've done. It really doesn't matter because every human being come under the same denominator that is condemnation because of sin. It is not a listing of your wrongdoing. It is the nature with which you were born. I want to give you an opportunity today to receive eternal life. A life that cannot be robbed away from you. A life cannot be taken away. It is a life that reconciles you back to the Father. Give you a place in His kingdom so He can come and live in you. The scripture said, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Christ is Lord, that life shall be granted to you. If you would like to do that, if you are here, you're watching, I just want you kindly, graciously, pray this prayer and believe in your heart. Say with me, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God, that you died for me on the cross. You paid the price in my place. You became sin so I can inherit eternal life. Here I am before you. Come and live in me. Let your kingdom live in me. Let your life be in me. And thank you for writing my name in the book of life. For giving me of all my sins. I am restored to the Father. To my creator. And I give you thanks. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Can we give a clap offering to the Lord this morning? Thank you, Lord. If you have received Jesus Christ, if you've prayed this prayer your first time, find a good church around your neighborhood. And if you live in Calgary and other places, there are cross point churches, come and join us because we want you to grow in knowing more this Jesus Christ as a family together. We love you already. Hallelujah. We're going to have communion. Let's stand up on our feet. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear because even the communion we are taking, it is just a remembrance talking about Christ. It's like a message. The communion we are taking is preaching. The communion we are taking speak of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The communion we are taking is salvation. Yeah. It is not the bread that gives you life because Christ is the bread of life. And the blood of Christ, that is just a representation. Hallelujah. So as we partake today of the element, I want you to remember that Jesus Christ surely loved you and he died for your sin. His body was pierced. The chastisement of the Father came upon him. By stripes were healed. Taking the communion won't heal you. But the faith in Christ stripes on the cross. There is your healing. Let's partake together in remembrance of him. Thank you, Lord. In the same manner, he took the cup of the blood of the wine. Lift it up and gave thanks and said, this is my blood for the remission of sin. In this blood, the new covenant is cut. We are living in it already. We honor you for your blood. We honor you for your sacrifice. We honor you for your resurrection. We honor you for life. We honor you for sanctification. We honor you. And we give you thanks for the victory that we have in you by faith. Let's partake together. May the blessing of the Lord remain upon you, church of God. May Christ become vivid in your spirit. May Christ become a reality, constantly aware that is not out there but is in you. That you may grow in his knowledge, that you may grow in his understanding, that you may grow in his wisdom. And remember, 
there's a memorial that has been set for us and that is the memorial that give us the assurance that no matter what the heck is going on in this world we are secure in Christ Jesus amen somebody give a praise to the Lord God bless you